Welcome to the Q Podcast. Q is about conversation. If we're really concerned about ending poverty, we've got to be more concerned about creating justice. Our cultural products as Christians need to both defy and resonate with the culture. But God's doing amazing things. His church is expanding. His church is growing. It's not what's the purpose of my life. It's what is the purpose that's been assigned. Stay curious. Think well. Advance good. This is Q. Welcome to another edition of the Q Podcast. I'm Gabe Lyons, and I'm so glad that you are listening in today because the conversation you're about to hear was one that was just so much fun for Rebecca and I. So my wife Rebecca and I have known Pete Richardson now for over 15 years. He's somebody who um, came into my life back when I was at a season where I was trying to determine which direction to go. It was before Q had ever been created. I was working in my beginning career in my 20s uh, for John Maxwell and his organization. I was a part of things such as Catalyst and getting to be a part of all kinds of great experiences, but I just felt God was leading me into a new direction and into a new season. And so Pete was somebody who had a lot more life experience than I had, had spent a great deal of his life helping others really navigate the path that God was calling them to. He's somebody that believes every single one of us has an assignment, and he's really committed all of his energy and time to helping people find that out. So part of that process is he does life planning. People meet with him and will spend a couple days just working through their past experiences, their talents, their skills, and then try to imagine how does God want to use all that to be a part of fulfilling a purpose in the world. And so Pete, beyond just being a friend, is an incredibly accomplished uh, leader. He does so much work at a company called Otterbox. If you've ever experienced like the phone cases that won't break, that's Otterbox, and his brother founded that company, and so he works alongside him. But most importantly, Pete would tell you that he's committed his life to just helping people really step into what God has for them and to not just live life confused or wondering whether they've missed what God has, but to really look towards the future and be intentional about taking steps towards that. And so with this conversation, what's going to be fun about it is you're going to get to hear Rebecca and I both just interact and ask questions with him uh, that really starts to unpack some wisdom that I just think for all of us will be inspiring, encouraging, and I hope it'll just remind you and encourage you that God has a purpose for you and that when we step into that, it's amazing to see the freedom we start to experience when we'll surrender to him. So let's listen in now. About 15 years ago, I sat above his, um, well, in his, his awesome home office where he pulls out these post-it pads and whiteboards and essentially starts asking you questions, much like a therapist would, to try to get into your head and your heart and, and discover what is going on there and what does God feel about that. And what's amazing is he's done something called life planning with almost a thousand people. I mean, we're close to that number now that he sits down with and spends two to three days. Sometimes it goes over the course of months or years, helping them think through what does God have for them. The first question I want to ask, just for those in the room who are curious, or maybe they're a little skeptical, like, do you believe that everybody has a calling? Is there some divine thing going on here that every human being, every Christian should seriously consider this? Because if they don't, what happens? Yeah, I do. Um, and, and part of it, I think, depends on how you define calling. When I was in seminary in the 1980s, calling was a tired word. It was a negative word. It sort of has new life right now. The way I define it and see it in Scripture is calling is, maybe in its simplest definition, what does God want me to do with the talents he's invested in me? So if I look at calling from a very sort of creative perspective, God as this great creator and 7.4 billion people on earth now and counting, does he have the capacity to uniquely invest unique talent, clumps of talent in each person? and then inspire their hearts to go use that in his world and creation in some way. Yes, so I believe calling is for everyone. It's not for a few. Um, How many go to the grave never discovering their calling and even tapping in and realizing it? It's probably a very small percentage. Yeah, so you think a small percentage goes to their grave not tapping into it, or a small percentage do actually find it? The majority of humanity goes to the grave never fully realizing their God-given talent 
and investing that and leveraging that in their lifetime. So just quickly, you, you have, I know this takes a lot of time to normally unpack, but just give us kind of the bullet points of like, what, how do you find your calling and this God assignment that you believe everybody has, how would you, how would you know that in the basic ways? Well, I think we have to pause long enough in the speed-driven lives we live to, to get perspective. And, and I, I don't think there's a, a linear approach to that. Yeah. I think it's seeing calling in the course of your lifetime. I think it's, it's understanding the intersection of what God's invested in you with the talents he's gifted you with. Yeah. And then listening to your God-inspired heart, and that's where it gets messy, but the heart is the compass. It points the way. And it, if, if you're listening to that God-inspired heart within you, it's telling you where to invest those talents. Mm. And so it, it, calling, the clues to calling are found in the intersection of my God-given talents and my God-inspired heart. Yeah, we have this slide up. I don't know if you want to explain more there. So the talent component, you know, I believe everyone in the world has three to five core talents. They're born with them. You see it, maybe the easiest metaphor would be, or example would be in athletics, right? Some kids just have natural athleticism, but talent neglected stagnates. So if it's not cultivated and invested in over time, it never reaches its potential. Talent tells me what God has gifted me to do. The heart is... Again, the compass. It tells me where God wants me to use that talent. The heart side of it, if you look at this other slide on the heart, this is a very simple slide on it, but, you know, Scripture, Ezekiel prophesied, I'm going to replace your heart of stone with the heart of flesh. I'm going to give you a new spirit. And, and as believers with God's spirit residing in these human temples, we have a resource outside of ourselves. So each one of these hearts, the sh here the shadow self, genuine self, some call the shadow self the false self, mm -hmm. the dark side, that has its own set of desires, its own ambitions. And if, if we talk shadow heart to shadow heart, it's a different conversation. But when we tap into this genuine true self, yeah. and which is very motivated to give back to the world, it's very other-centered. Right then we have a different conversation. And that's the compass heart we want to tap into when we talk about God inspiring my heart's desires. Mm -hmm. Well, in the Christian community, I know it, a lot of emphasis can go into this idea of calling, but sometimes it's all about men yeah. sort of pursuing calling and women. And Rebecca, maybe you should speak to that, but then followed up maybe asking Pete, because you guys have had a lot of conversations about this, but how does, how does this specific conversation relate to women? When Gabe said, I want to send you, I was early 30s, he said, I'm going to send you to meet with Pete for a day, and I really want you to talk to him about calling. And I remember going, I don't want a calling, I want a piano. And so then he started looking <laughs> for a piano on Craigslist. I was turning 35, and he was trying to do something really, you know. And what's funny is two years later, here I find myself with Pete in New York. The Lord just was orchestrating something before I was even ready. And I think sometimes we hear this idea of calling and it's so intimidating, like maybe I'm not going to get it right. Or maybe it's this like elusive thing that floats in the air. And if I'm lucky enough, I'll, I'll grasp it. And I know I've sp spoken to college students about this and women. And that that common thread is like, even if we believe that we do have a calling, it still feels so overwhelming. And there's this intense pressure to get it right. And so, um, I want to speak to the unworthiness of a calling. Like there's some that just say that's an indulgent conversation and I've, I've got my head down and I'm taking care of littles and I don't really have capacity for that. It's really unveiling what's already there, right? And so speak to how you, you spoke to the Q women about the seasons of that. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about what that would look like. Well, first of all, I don't think calling is gender related. And, and I think it's, it's, again, rooted in God's creativity and how he creates every person uniquely. So... I think what I find is, again, back to the, the culture we live in, we want it quick. And if we can get perspective on our birth to death journey, this side of death, however many days God gives us on earth, um, sometimes there's decades of foundation laying that you don't know at the time in your 20s and 30s and even 40s, how God's preparing you for this sense of focus calling later on in maybe the 50s and 60s. But the other thing is, I don't think calling is just work or vocation related. It's holistic. My calling should apply to all my relationships, certainly in my family, with my friends, my community, and into the body of Christ beyond work. And there should be continuity in that. 
And that is discovered over time. And so, you know, I work with a lot of people in their 20s and 30s, that generation. And much of the 20s is about experimentation. What does my heart really long for? And what doesn't it long for? And that takes sometimes years and decades to play out. Even the stay-at-home mom has God-given talent. And it can be cultivated and developed. Um, There's common callings, as we might say, common purposes that are a given. And we dare not discard those in the name of this so-called higher calling. And so if if I'm a husband or a wife, I'm called to be a loving husband and wife. That's just a given. Um, I'm called to follow Jesus. That's an invitation. Follow me. If I have kids, I'm called to invest in them. So we have to, I think, God's call in our life is more holistic than just work-focused. And yeah. Well, I would just add, to, and something we've talked about at Q a lot, especially for men in the room, is like in my journey with Rebecca, when I said at 35 years old, why don't you go spend time with Pete? It was, it was understanding that when you start to come alive, everything comes alive. And for a lot of husbands, even some of you are probably here in this room and you left a family behind and this is your calling to come be at Q maybe and learn and do this for your job or for your career, um, is to understand that, that for your spouse, um, it is critical that you be the one to help unlock the possibilities for them and to help them start to uncover and discover this. And many times that may not happen if you don't take the initiative to say, I want you to discover more or to remember. It's not about finding something new many times, it's uncovering what's always been there in, in the person that you married and helping them recover that in seasons where kids can kind of take over life and distractions. And I know, Rebecca, as you travel and speak to a lot of women, you're seeing so many women just kind of awake to that. Just giving them permission and time. Like you said, processing this does take time. And sometimes you've got your head down and you don't have the margin or even the mental space to go there. And I liked early on, you said sometimes this process takes some people up to 18 months to even just dig into for a first step. And I think that's proven true for me and a lot of us as you kind of trip into the things that are making your heart come alive or making your heart sing. Well, you guys are an example of what you're talking about. You know, Gabe, you encouraging Rebecca over the years, your fear, right? And then you leaning in, discovering and and being a mom, but still having this other sense of contribution. So is it easy? No. I, I think the only way you fully own your calling is to fully surrender to it. And that's where I find a lot of men and women trip up. You're, they're like one degree away from full surrender. And that can lead to a very frustrating sense of calling. Mm. And, and when I, it's like, I've, I, think, I think fear is the great nemesis of the call, which makes sense. And that, it's not rooted in the voice of God's call in our lives. And it's like, it's standing in that doorway saying, don't go through there. You can't do it. You don't have a calling. You don't have what it takes. And actually... Fear points the way. And if you go towards the fear and through the door on the other side, people usually say, what was I so afraid of? Well, and Pete, that was one thing I remembered when 15 years ago, we're, we're working on my life plan and we're in your home office and off on the wall were these rolled up pieces of paper that looked like where you'd done life plans with people and they were stacked and there, there had to be 25 of them just laying there. And I said, whose life plans are those? Why didn't they take them with them? And you you said to me, these are people who we got to a certain part in the process with them and they couldn't go past it and they'll come back at a certain time and we'll pick it up and keep working on. But this idea of surrender, will you speak to that a little? Like, what are the things that tend to stop us? One of them is fear, but what are the fear? Fears of what? Real practically for people in this room, because some of these people, they've already worked through that, but they're leading others who are trying to figure out these conversations. How can they coach and lead people kind of through those doors? Yeah, well, first of all, I think, theologians call this an antinomy, right? Two different, almost antithetical concepts that don't fit together. But Jesus said, if you want to live, you must die. The surrender concept, if you want to be free, you must fully surrender. So what does that mean? It's where you you give up full control of things God has not designed us to control. Um, Gary Smalley, one of you know our friends who's now with the Lord just a month ago, but he gave a valus word that really is a good framework for surrender. And there's a slide to it here, but the word is frumph. <laughs> frumph. How's that for a word? Frumph. Uh, I've never forgotten it out of all my years of hearing messages, but I won't tell the full story, but it, he, he actually had a coffin up on the platform as an illustration of how he went through each one of these words. And so one of the, the first one, F, is a fear of the future. 
and how that can be very paralyzing. A fear I might fail if I move into the future with this sense of calling, a, a, a fear that I don't have what it takes, I'm fooling myself. And so, you know, as we sort of surrender our future to the Lord fully and understand this life we have is a one-time gift that we have some control over, but a lot we don't. And we surrender that the reputation word is fear of what other people think of me. And so I've seen that paralyze people moving forward. If I do that, my family, my friends, those closest to me, my parents, my dad, my mom will think differently of me. And then, of course, there's the money component. If I do this, I won't have enough cash flow. I won't have health insurance. I've seen a lot of fear of not having health insurance trip people up, to be honest. Just very practical. Um, Fear of my possessions. If I do that, I won't have the quality of life that we have. And then fear of time. You know, I don't have time. Time's, I'm growing too old. I'm too old for a call. I've seen that on the other end of the age spectrum. Mm. Or I'm too young for one. Oh yeah, I'm just a mom. I don't, I don't really have a, a special contribution. And then of course, health. So, and there's other components that can trip us up. But yeah. when we fully surrender to these kinds of things and whatever other, I think fear is never going away. So we better learn how to relate to it. And it has a lot of voices and a lot of faces. I remember when we finally met uh, together a couple of years after this initial offering and we were in New York and you started the session with a Viktor Frankl quote saying, life is never made unbearable by circumstances, but by lack of meaning and purpose. And I was like, yes, I'm here. I'm going to come here. And I'm, I'm in New York and we're going to find uh, meaning. Uh, you know, I'm like searching the city for meaning. And what I, I then developed panic disorder and it was like an 18 month spiral and I learned that meaning, instead I found surrender. I was chasing after meaning and I found surrender. And today I can tell you that meaning follows surrender. Yeah. And, and so it activates, the surrender itself is what activates our call in a way that we, we weren't even expecting. And it just kind of mobilizes something. And I do think that's God's spirit in us saying, you're going this way, but what you don't really know is I'm actually leading you this way. Yeah. Pete, level with us. I mean, we've got three minutes, but part of what I wanted you to speak to, you've sat with hundreds of Christian leaders, a lot like the people sitting here, having probably some of the most private, intimate, confidential conversations they were ever willing to have with someone about their surrender, that, that topic, but also that how God uses suffering in their life to, to do things. And I know even in my own like, life with a counselor who's been helping me work through stuff, he, he, he says, look, the Christian community is the one community where it's, it's like perfectly suited for somebody who's super achievement-oriented, really interested in success. It just kind of helps them like run down that path and, and lead things and, and be visible to people. And it fulfills like a lot of wounding. And so that's why you see a lot of things happen in the Christian community that maybe you don't see as much other places or, or you don't expect it as much. How would you speak to all of us today about taking seriously that caution and those wounds and how much this idea of pursuing calling can sometimes become an idol. Like, how would you just speak to our hearts? And we won't have time, obviously, to work through it, but at least help people start to go down a path when they leave here tomorrow to think about some things. Yeah, Kelly said it really well yesterday when she said, if, if, if your identity is in seeking the destination of an achievement, your identity is probably in the achievement. God wants our hearts. And I totally agree with that. So, I think we have a messed up view of suffering. I think Viktor Frankl has it right. He has a beautiful theology of suffering. And and even Paul wrote about, we grow through embracing the sufferings of Jesus and how those play out in our lifetime. So there's a lot to learn in the dark seasons of life. They're not to be glossed over. We call those sort of life gate moments in someone's storyline. And, and those can be radically transformational and beautiful in the outcome. Surrender is the portal to living the life God designed you to live. And if you don't fully go through it, you'll have a shortened, frustrated view of your sense of calling. Mm. Because full surrender realigns the motives. Proverbs 16, 2 says, God is weighing the motives of the heart. And that's It really all comes down to motives. What's driving me to do what I'm doing? Why am I doing that? And when that's more this than this, it changes the game. And that's that's the life of joy where we find meeting on the other side of great loss and suffering. 
Yeah. Well, f- any final thoughts just to encourage us as these guys go back and they're, they're leading, you know, college students and people who are going to pursue these questions, the best thing they could do when that person comes and says, hey, I really want to pursue my passion. What's the next step in that conversation? Engage them, engage their stories, walk with them through the process of discovery over time. It's not a book necessarily. It's not a short experience. It's a journey. Well, Pete, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and insights with us. Let's thank them for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I told you you'd like Pete. You know, this is the kind of guy that if you could sit down and have coffee with anybody, he'd be one of the tops because he has so many stories, so many experiences, and, and so much wisdom. Maybe share this with a friend. Share it with somebody that maybe you know who's right in the middle of that season of their life where they're trying to figure out what's next. And maybe they're confused or maybe feeling unfulfilled in the current role that they're playing out and think that there must be something more. This would be the kind of thing, if they listen to it, it'd probably encourage them on these really crucial ways to think about calling. Well, thank you for being a part of Q. Thank you for listening in, and I look forward to our next episode together. Hope you have a great week. I want to invite you to continue this conversation in person by being a part of Q Commons taking place on Thursday evening, October 13th, in communities throughout America. On this particular evening, we're bringing together key voices to help you know how to engage our divided nation. We're going to have Dr. Ravi Zacharias talking about our divided moment and what does faithfulness look like in the middle of that. We're going to also have Grammy Award-winning artist Lecrae talking about race in America. And finally, Kirsten Powers and Ross Douthat, two political commentators talking about the upcoming presidential election and how should Christians think about voting. It's sure to be an evening that's going to help you think well about what it means to bring hope and leadership to your communities at a time where divisiveness is ruling the day. So join us by learning more at qcommons.com. Find the city near you. And if you don't see one in your community, host it at your church. You can learn more at qcommons.com slash private simulcast. <laughs>